Does anybody here know who Wally Pip is besides me? Wally Pip in 1925 was a first baseman for the New York Yankees. And he came to work one day at the ballpark and he told the coach, he said, man, I don't feel well, coach. I got a terrible headache and I just feel sick. The coach said, no problem. We got a rookie named Lou Gehrig. We'll play, put him in at first base. Lou Gehrig went two for three that first day. Lou Gehrig played first base for the New York Yankees for 2,130 consecutive games, a major league record until it was broke by Cal Ripken in 1982 covering 14 seasons. And Wally Pipp became a footnote in baseball history. Well, I'm not Lou Gehrig, okay? Brandon will be back next week. Brandon is in Mattoon this morning. Pastor Brad, as you know, his wife's birthday was this past week. And he always takes the week between Christmas and New Year's off. And at the last elders meeting, he says, uh, well, I'll just cut it short and come back on Saturday so I can preach on Sunday. And a couple of us said, don't be silly. You know, Brad, we are so blessed to have Pastor Brad and Pastor Brandon on staff at Family Worship. And looking back over the past year, they each took one Sunday off. And so it was a, it was a no-brainer to say, Brad, take a day off. Matter of fact, don't answer your text, turn your phone off, take a week to recharge. And I just got a text before church because I'm praying for you. That is the first thing I've heard from Pastor Brad all week. So Brandon will be back next week. He's entertaining the Matt Toon crowd today. But I do have some father or some dad jokes. Who, you know, we're not going to go one week, <laughs> one week without a couple of fathers or dad jokes. And here's my favorite, and most of you may not get it, but I'm a movie buff. Okay, what do you call it when Batman skips church? Christian Bale. <laughs> How do potatoes solve their problems? They hash things out. And how do vegans start their prayer? Let us pray. And my final one is one I had to throw in because in my message today, it's all about New Year's Day. It wasn't hard to figure out what to talk about today. But I didn't have any place I could fit Moses in the Red Sea into the lesson. And as you know, it's kind of a private joke here. We have Moses in the Red Sea brought up every week. So what did Moses, how does Moses make his coffee? He brews it. <laughs> we'll get started. How many times in the past week, two weeks, or you think in the next couple weeks, you're going to hear or say, Happy New Year? You know, the, year, the New Year is supposed to bring hope, but... Has anybody besides myself ran into those people and say, well, I don't know what's so happy about it, or same, fill in the blank, just a different year? But too often for a lot of people now, especially in today's society, New Year's feels grim. We resolve to be virtuous, to lose weight, to exercise, to unplug from social media, but we always want to bring up our past failures and fear another losing struggle in our lives. We toast to a better and happier 2023 but we fear there will be endless weeks of bad news. Our minds and lives are skewed, skewed by a fundamental imbalance that's now becoming clear to scientists who have studied it. And they call it the negativity effect or the negativity bias. It's the universal tendency for bad events and emotions to affect us more than positive events in our lives. We're devastated by a word of criticism, but unmoved by a shower of praise. We see the hostile face in the crowd, but miss all the friendly smiles. We focus so much on the bad news, especially in a digital world where it's amplified 10 times, that we don't realize how much better life can be. B. Stephen Leacock was a Canadian teacher, political scientist, and writer who wrote, how strange is our little possession called life. The child says, when I'm big, and then when grown up here, she says, when I am married, but then the thought turns, well, when, when I'm able to retire, and when retirement comes, we look back over the landscape to right, traversed, and a cold wind blows over it. Somehow, we've missed it all, and it's gone. Life, we learn, too late, is in the living, in the tissue of every day, every hour of our existence. But isn't that the way most people think about New Year, with a, a sense of defeatism rather than viewing the New Year as a, as a New beginning. Congratulations. We all have survived another 365-day battle with life, and God has rewarded us with a new year. 
a new year for new beginnings, new challenges, new opportunities, new friendships, and for adventures we've long sought. And more importantly, for new works that you can accomplish for our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. This past week, millions of Americans have made resolutions. I, I typically gave up on them some time ago. Research by Stava surveyed 800 million people, and it showed the top resolutions going into 2023 are as follows. 52% exercise more, 50% to eat healthier, 40% to lose weight. Now, gym owners are just salivating at seeing all that news, right? Gym membership for the next month, will be, the gyms will be packed. 39% save more money. 37% spend more time with our family and friends. 20% less time on social media or electronic devices. 19% reduce stress on their job. And 19% reduce their living expenses and plan a budget. But the same poll also found that most people had given up on their New Year's resolutions by January 19th. That is nationally known as Quitter's Day. And 80% of all people who admit who they made resolutions, they're usually failed by the first day of February. As we enter the new year, be aware. We have a full year of possibilities and opportunities. 12 months, 52 weeks, 365 days, and as of 10 o'clock this morning when the service started, 8,750 hours, 525,000 minutes, and 31,500,000 seconds. Have you ever thought how much can happen in a second? We all know somebody either in our family or somebody in our friend's family that's had a stroke, heart attack, car accident. One second can mean everything. I want you to think about this. It takes a second to smile at a stranger or hold a door open or say thank you or give a compliment that can brighten someone's day. Perhaps they were clouded in sadness and your words of encouragement were rays of hope that broke through to them. You don't know, and you never will. It takes a second to say, I love you. That's it, just one second. But at that moment, everything changes. At that moment, worlds collide, and hearts are molded, and lives become intertwined. It, in the second it takes you to utter those three words, the rest of your life can be unfolding into something new. It takes one second to risk the precious things in our lives. One second to hit the send on that text that we probably shouldn't send. One second to engage in that fight. Or one second to walk away from it. And it takes one second for us to say, I'm struggling, I'm hurting, but I know I'm going to do better. I'm owning the fact that I'm not doing well, I'm hurting, I'm struggling, and from this moment on, I really want to do better. I don't want to wait. Now change doesn't happen overnight. And maybe we'll slip up again. But the second you plant that seed of change is the moment your life will begin to change. There are 86,400 seconds in one day. That's 86,000 decisions, 86,000 choices, and 86,000 moments that are like there to live, moments for the taking that we'll never get back. If we're going to talk about having a happy new year, there are a few things we need to bear in mind. We are one year closer to the year of our death or the day the Lord comes to take us. Just one second can drastically change that. I want to remind you of what it says in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 10. For we all must appear before the judgment seat of Christ so that each of us may receive what is due for us, things done while in our body whether good or bad. Judgment day. And, we, you know, a lot of people, and this is what I've always learned, it's not about the works if the motives behind the works are bad. It's what's in your heart. Jesus will see that. So you could do all the great works in the world, but if you don't have love and, love and compassion in your heart, it doesn't matter. Standing before Christ on judgment day, he will either say, Matthew 25, 34, then the king will say to those on the right, Come, you who are blessed by my Father, take your inheritance, the kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. Or he will say, Matthew 25, 41. Then he will say to those on his left, Depart from me, you who are cursed, and the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. 
Since I mentioned that we're one year closer to that day when our final destiny will be forever determined, let's take this opportunity first to provoke how you feel you've used this past year. And second, to look at how we could change in this coming year. Our goal should be to strive to make better use of the time we have left and to prepare us for the day of reckoning that awaits us. Let us then begin by asking some simple questions. In the past year, has our relationship with God and Christ improved? Have we drawn nearer to God? James 4.8 says, come near to God and he will come near to you. When a person sets to seek out God, God sets out to seek meet you. So that while we are drawing near to him, he's also drawing nearer to us. What does it mean to draw near to God? It means to draw near in worship, praise, and prayer. It means to draw near in seeking the counsel of God, which we fail to do many times. It means to draw near and enjoy communion with God, which we did today. It means to draw near in the daily course of our lives. In one way, this verse illustrates the difference between the Old Covenant and the New Covenant. In Exodus 3, 5, God says to Moses, Do not come any closer. Take off your sandals, for the place that you are standing on is holy ground. But under the New Covenant, again God says to the sinner in James 4, 8, Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your heart, you double-minded. The difference between the two is that the ground between God and the sinner has been sprinkled with the blood of Jesus Christ. And we can come close to God based on that blood that was shed for us that day upon the cross. Now bear in mind that developing a close relationship depends upon good communication. Have we been faithful in listening to God through His Word? Another year has gone by. Did we read through the Bible? If not, or especially if we never have, can we honestly say that we're taking our relationship with God seriously? We read in 2 Timothy 3, 16-17, All Scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in the righteousness. Have we been steadfast in talking to God through our prayer? Any effective communication everybody knows is a two-way street. Therefore, fervent Bible study should be joined with fervent prayer. Has our degree of prayer increased or decreased in this past year? A couple of short verses on prayer are as follows. Mark eleven twenty four. Therefore I tell you, whenever you ask for prayer, in prayer, believe that you have received it and it will be yours. Philippians 4, 6-7. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God and the peace of God which transcends all understanding will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. And finally, James 5, verse 16. Therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. Has our relationship with our Christian brothers and sisters improved? Has our love for one another in our Christian group increased this year? Paul speaks of this in 1 Thessalonians 4, 9 through 10. How about your love for one another? We do not need to write to you, for you yourselves have been taught by God to love each other. And in fact, you do love all of God's family throughout Macedonia. Yet we urge you, brothers and sisters, to do so more and more. Are we any closer to each other in this room than we were a year ago? Do we even know who our brethren are? Do we even know everybody's name? Each year brings new members into our church, into our congregation. Have we made any effort to know anything about them or know their names? Has our relationship with those in the world improved? As people of God, we have an important responsibility towards those in the world. In Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, he said, Matthew 5, 13, you are the salt of the earth. But if the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot. You are the salt of the earth. We all are. As followers of Christ, we are like salt because we are precious. In Jesus' day, salt was a very valued commodity. Roman soldiers were sometimes paid with salt, giving the praise, worth its salt. Being the salt of the earth, Christ's followers are like salt because they have a persevering influence. Salt used to preserve meats and slow decay. 
Christians should have a preserving influence on their culture and all those around them. And as salt of the earth, we all know that salt adds flavor. And when I was thinking out my thoughts, I'm going to tell you a quick story. When I started dating Patty, the first few times I went to her parents' house for dinner, of course, she wanted to make a good impression. And her salt shaker was like one of those Tupperware tea, cut, tea containers with the big handle on the side. And they'd pass it around and just shake, 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 shake. I don't, personally don't like salt. So I did the couple of taps on it with my finger just so they didn't think, what is wrong with this kid? But if you love salt, you love salt. But we know salt adds flavor. Disciples are like salt because they add flavor. As Christians, we should be flavorful people. Amen? If we, if we were true disciples of Christ, and if we are true to our calling, we should make the earth a purer and more palatable place. But salt loses its flavor, as we well know. Then it's good for nothing. Salt must keep its saltiness to be of any value. When it's no good as salt, it's trampled underfoot, as Scripture says. In the same way, too many Christians lose their flavor and become good for nothing also. If we talk about salt, and then we need to talk about light. Before we get started in John 8, 12, which is the verse I would go to, I, w- I want to set up the uh, prior first 11 verses of, of John, James chapter, John chapter 8. And I'm going to say this one time. It's probably one of my fit, most favorite stories in the Bible. <laughs> I have to say that because I think Brandon will watch the sermon. <laughs> Jesus, as you know, was teaching in the temple, and the the Pharisees and the scribes brought in a woman who was uh, accused of adultery. And they were debating, you know, under old Jewish law, the the penalty for adultery was to be stoned to death. Now, I don't know if you're like me, but as I read that story, and I've read it multiple times, adultery takes two people. And it's like, where's the man? He's never mentioned. But anyway, you know the story, and and Jesus says, those without sin throw the first stone. Well, it's obvious. The only person in that crowd that didn't have any sin was Christ himself. So the story goes, they started filtering away, and for some reason, most scholars believe that they went by age with the oldest first, and it would dwindle down to where it was just Christ and the woman standing there in in the temple. And uh, the woman, guilty of sin and a great sin, knew the goodness of having no condemnation. She passed from sin and a death sentence to forgiveness and life. The woman found refuge in the connection to Jesus, and so can you. In a sense, Jesus here reminded us of the great truth in Romans 8.1, that there is no condemnation for those who are in Jesus Christ. Verse 8.12, Jesus spoke to the, to the, other, the rest of the people in the temple, saying, I am the light of the world. He who follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have light of, lo- light of the life. It reminds me of the pillar in Exodus. As you know, in the 40-year journey, there was always a pillar of light that traveled along the journey, uh, uh, light up in the sky. And now Jesus has taken this important symbol, light, and has applied it to himself. I am the light of the world. Matthew 5, 14 tells us, you are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do they light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a lampstand. And it gives light to all those who are in the house. Let your light shine before men, that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. Jesus gives us as Christians a great compliment here and a great responsibility. You've got to realize it says, we are the light of the world. Because he claimed the title for himself as he walked the earth, he's now passing that responsibility onto us. Light of the world means that not only are we light receivers, but we should be light givers. We must have a greater concern for not only ourselves, but for others. And we cannot live only to ourselves. We must have something to shine on to and to do so lovingly. In the Old Testament days, I I find it interesting that the, the, the most distinguished rabbis were referred to as the light of the world by the Jewish people. And how do you think they felt, the scribes and the Pharisees, seeing that a fisherman and basically this ragtag bunch was now being called the light of the world? I wish to emphasize here that Jesus never challenged us to become salt or light. He simply said, we are. And we're either fulfilling or failing that given responsibility. Which are, which are you doing or myself? A key thought in both pictures of salt and light is distinction. Salt is needed because the world currently around us is rotting and decaying. If you watch the evening news, it's just 
bad news after bad news after bad news. And if our Christianity is also rotting to Cain, it wouldn't be any good either. Light is needed because the world, as we know it, is in darkness. And if our Christianity imitates the darkness, we have nothing to show the world about abundant grace and the love of Christ. To be effective, we must seek and display the, this Christian distinctive. We can never affect the world for Jesus by coming, becoming like the world. One more time. If to be effective as Christians, we must seek and display the Christian distinctive, we can never affect the world for Jesus by becoming like the world. Have we made progress this year in developing a meaningful relationship with people in the world so the light of Christ can be seen in our lives, so the gospel of Christ can be communicated to them? Or are we like most neighbors in this day and age, living next door to each other, but not really knowing each other? A survey by Pew Research found that 28%, 28 of the people in the world have no idea what their neighbors' names even are. We've kind of forgotten the act of Southern hospitality. The question I'm raising can be summarized in this way. Another year has gone by. Have we made good use of our time the Lord has given us, or have we wasted it? It's likely that all of us, myself included to some degree, have not made good use of our time. So at this point, let's look at the word of Paul in Philippians. In Philippians 3.13, or Philippians 3.13-14, 3, he says, Brothers and sisters, I do not concern myself yet to have taken hold of it. But one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is ahead, I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward, heavenward in Jesus Christ. With this attitude of pressing forward, let's look at a couple of resolutions that we could do for the new year. Number one, resolve to draw near to God in Christ. Do we have a daily reading program of God's Word? The Bible is 66 books, 1,189 chapters. That figures out to 3.25 chapters per day. It's not out, it's not out of reach. Hebrews 4.12, for the word of God is alive and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and the attitudes of the heart. I want you to read the Old Testament. And I've read the Bible cover to cover a couple of times, and I get it. You get to Numbers, Leviticus, Leviticus and Deuteronomy, and you're like, oh, brother. But there's importance in the Old Testament. The Old Testament, was, you've got to remember, was Jesus' only scripture and makes up three-fourths, 75.55% exactly, of the Bible. If space says anything, the Old Testament matters to God who gave the word in his book. In fact, it was the first special revelation which, sat, which set the foundation for the film, fulfillment we find of Christ's arrival in the New Testament. Jesus has said that the Old Testament points to him. After his first encounter with Jesus, Philip announced to Nathanael in John 145, we have found him of whom Moses and the law and the prophet spoke. Do you want to see and savor Jesus as much as you can? We find him in the Old Testament as Jesus himself said we would. We read in the following scriptures in the Old Testament of Romans 15.4, which for everything that was written in the past was written to teach us. So that through the endurance taught in the scriptures and the encouragement they provide, we might have hope. And 2 Timothy 3.14, but as for you, continue in what you've learned and have become convinced of, because you know of those from whom you've learned it, and how from infancy you have known in the Holy Scriptures, which are to make you wise for your salvation through Christ and Jesus. The New Testament is important also. It's all about Jesus. The gospel showed how he lived, died, and rose. The acts and the works of the apostles show us glimpses into his message, spread to all the people. And of course, Revelation discloses the way Jesus will return on the day of judgment. In the New Testament, we see Jesus in all his complexity. He was a simple man from Galilee, yet he preached the word of God with keen understanding. He was a miracle worker, but he faced a lot of struggles from his own people. Jesus only lived for 33 years in this world. But within those three decades, he exhorted people to return to God. He gave sermons and parables to open minds and heal hearts and to show the way for eternal salvation. The following scriptures are important in the New Testament. 
James 1, 21. Therefore, get rid, of all, get rid of all moral filth and the evil that is so prevalent, and humbly accept the word planted in you which can save you. And 1 Peter 2, 2 says, like newborn babies, crave the pure spiritual milk so that it may grow, you may grow up in your salvation. As I said earlier, reading the Bible has also got to be accompanied by prayer. That is vitally important. Hebrews 4, 14 through 16 says, Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has ascended into heaven, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith we profess. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to emphasize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet he did not sin. Let us then approach God's throne of grace with grace and confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. We need to pray with a thankful heart. A scripture that emphasizes that is Colossians 4.2. Devote yourselves to prayer, being watchful and thankful. And 1 Thessalonians 5.17 says, Pray continually, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Jesus Christ. We all remember Daniel in the Old Testament. And Daniel had a custom of praying three times a day. Maybe that would be worthy of our attention. It says in Daniel... Now, when Daniel learned that the decree had been published, he went home to his upstairs room where the windows were open towards Jerusalem. Three times a day, he got down on his knees and prayed, giving thanks to God, just as he had done before. Next, in the new year, we need to resolve to come closer to our brothers and sisters in Christ, making a point to learn everybody's name. Each week, making a goal to connect with a couple people and faces till you learn them all. And finally, to resolve to get to know our non-Christian friends better. First of all, we are to love our non-Christian neighbors because the Lord God has commanded us to. We see this in the way in which Lord Jesus answered the Pharisees in Matthew 22, 36-39. And, and believe me, I didn't show this, this sermon to Jeff. Teacher, what is the greatest commandment in the law? Jesus replied, love your Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and with all your mind. This is the greatest commandment and the second is love your neighbor as yourself. Secondly, we should love our non-Christian neighbors because we have so much in common with them. We're all made in God's image, and that's what's enabled us to have sympathy. All human beings are under the same condemnation that was put upon Adam. We all experience disease and death. We all experience pain and suffering. Because we are all in this together, we should seek to help others who are suffering, especially those who are suffering more than we are. Third, everyone needs love. We love our non-Christian neighbors because all men, all women, good and bad, need love. In Christ, in God's providence, he brings us ever so often in contact with needy individuals. When you, when you respond, you're fulfilling a Christian calling, just like the Good Samaritan in Luke chapter 10. It's got nothing to do with proximity or physical distance. It's got nothing to do with human kinship. You're fulfilling God's wish, which he has arranged that meeting for you. You may know Mark Bettinger. Mark's a pastor here in town, and he posted on Facebook the other day a very startling study. And it, it said, in a study, it was revealed that 95% of all Christians have never helped someone begin their relationship with Christ. Based on CNRS, there are 619 million Christians in the world. That means that 588 million have never shared the faith with someone. Just imagine if each of, if each of these 619 million shared their faith story with someone who led them to Christ. Imagine the impact that would have on our world. I read, the, I read this quote somewhere once, and it said, we, are called, we are not, aren't called to be like other Christians. We are called to be like Christ. As I prepare to close, and, and I'll be a lot quicker than Brandon, <laughs> these resolutions may sound simplistic, but if implemented, they go a long way. First, to producing the kind of lifestyle that is becoming of a Christian and B, to increasing closer relationships with God, the brethren, and the lost. That, in turn, will bless our lives and be a blessing to the church and our community. Remember I said earlier that time is a precious commodity given to us by God that is truly like a vapor, as it says in James 4, 13 through 15. Now listen, you who say, today or tomorrow we will go into this city, spend a year there, carrying on business and make money. Why, you do not even know what will happen tomorrow. What is your life? You are a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes. Instead, you ought to say, if it is the Lord's will, we will live and we'll do this or do that. 
And Ephesians 5, 15 through 16 says, be very careful then how you live. Not as unwise, but as wise, making the most of every opportunity because the days are evil. I hope these suggestions for resolutions for the year will help you in making better use of it. Finally, let me share a following poem of which the author is unknown. It's titled, A New Year, A New Beginning. The old year ends, a new begins, with pages clean and new. And what is written on each page will depend now upon you. You can't relieve the year that's passed, erasing any wrong, every wrong. For once a year or day is spent, it is forever gone. But don't give up in dark despair if you have failed some test. Seek God's forgiveness and resolve henceforth to do your best. Resolve each precious day to do things that are good and pure. Though days and years may pass, these things will still endure. You know not where your path may lead, not what's beyond the hill, but know that God walks at your side if you will do as will. All things are possible with God through days bright or dim. So do your best to know that you can leave the rest to him. As we prepare for the altar call, there's not many here today, but if there's somebody struggling, somebody that doesn't know Christ, somebody that's slipped up and wants to rededicate their lives, please come forward. Jeff's going to come up with me. We'd love to pray with you, pray for you. Okay, and let's close in prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you for allowing us to gather and share the time together. Thank you for allowing us to join together as brothers and sisters in Christ. We pray that we will continue to learn and understand the words that you have placed upon our hearts. In time, help us your words grow and blossom into wonderful opportunities to truly be the hands and feet of Christ. We are thankful that you gave us daily opportunities to communicate with and learn more about you. As we go forward into the new year, may we meet the rest of the world. May we carry this message within our hearts. May your words impact our minds and current and future relationships and lives. May, such, may each of our actions during this week help us to walk in your path and to better serve you. We thank you for all the blessings you've given us and ask that we may continue to grow in your love. Amen.